Bloodletting It might seem crazy to you now, but bloodletting was the bread and butter of medical doctors at the time. Fever? Bloodletting. Inability to get pregnant? That's a bloodletting. Bloodletting was based on the idea that an imbalance of bodily humors caused diseases and conditions, and by removing some of a person's blood, the humors could be brought back into balance. The humors are blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. So their logic was someone is sick because of an excess in one of these. Today, if a doctor suggested draining one liter of blood to cure the plague, you could quickly check Google for a second opinion. But to the 13th century peasant, doubting a highly distinguished doctor was to doubt a man who was more educated than you in many ways. In many cases, this actually caused more harm than good. Removing significant amounts of blood could lead to anemia, weakness, and even death, especially in already ill or weakened individuals. The practice stuck around for quite quite a long time, only ending in the late 19th century when doctors finally discovered germs that cause diseases. Trepanation Desperate times call for desperate measures, and what's more desperate than drilling a hole into the skull of a plague victim? The belief here was that this procedure could reduce various conditions by relieving pressure on the brain or allowing the escape of evil spirits or toxins thought to be causing the illness. As the death toll climbed into the millions, surgeons turned to increasingly desperate methods in their attempts to find a cure. Mind you, at the time, surgeons went from the morgue to delivering babies without washing their hands. On top of the fact that anesthesia wasn't even a thing then, it meant barber surgeons would use essential tools tools like hand drills or saws to remove a portion of the patient's skull while they were still conscious and aware. Because of this, there were risks including infection, bleeding, and potential brain damage or death. So the choices weren't all the best, either risk dying from the plague or risk becoming a vegetable. Miasma Theory Remedies The idea here was that diseases were caused by bad air or a vapor. This miasma was believed to come from rotting organic matter, stagnant water, and other foul odors. So, the next logical step would be to try and get rid of this bad air by doing things like burning aromatic herbs and incense. The belief was that the pleasant aromas would counteract the miasmas and purify the air. Herbs like rosemary, sage, and lavender were commonly used. Using strong-smelling substances, vinegar, camphor, and other aromatic substances were thought to remove miasma through their strong odors. Hence, we have the Plague Doctor outfit with the long sort of beak inside. These masks were full of flowers, jasmine, and other sweet-smelling things so they wouldn't inhale the bad air around victims. Well, it did work to some degrees, simply because they wore entire body suits, which was good for them as they were protected from getting in contact with the sick people. But horrible for the victims, as washing hands after seeing a patient was hearsay at the time, so they transferred the germs on their leather gloves from one patient to the next. Mercury Treatments when medieval doctors and alchemists discovered mercury's unique properties, like how it's a liquid metal at room temperature, the idea of such a thing happening only meant that this was a special thing and could be used to treat illness. Since alchemists use mercury as a cleaner, people believed it would work the same in humans. Mercury pills go in, and it purifies the body by getting rid of all the diseases inside. Patients were prescribed mercury pills, ointments, or even subjected to mercury mercury vapor baths. Mercury is a highly toxic substance that causes severe damage to the nervous system, kidneys, and other organs when ingested or absorbed through the skin. The mercury cures weakened plague victims even further, hastening their deaths through heavy metal poisoning. It was basically a zero-sum game with the fact if the mercury pills didn't work, doctors would simply increase the dosage, thinking it wasn't enough. If, coincidentally, you took the pills and did get better, say due to a strong immune system that's fighting the plague and mercury poisoning, it would be seen as, see, the treatment worked, making doctors prescribe it even more. Quarantine Initial Failures for all the quack medicine medieval doctors used to practice, they did try to employ a few good ones like quarantines. However, because they thought the diseases were caused by bad air and an imbalance of the humor, 
their approach had mixed results. Venice was one of the first to try quarantine. Ships had to wait offshore for 40 days before docking. This is where quarantine comes from. This measure aimed to prevent the plague's introduction from foreign ports. However, quarantine measures were often haphazard and ineffective because of a lack of scientific understanding of the actual cause and modes of transmission of the plague. On top of the fact that the average peasant back then couldn't comprehend the need for being separated from his family or his way of earning money, just like modern humans. Leech Therapy with the humor's theory so popular, a better way to remove the toxins in the blood would be to use blood-sucking parasites known as leeches to help remove these excess humors. During widespread plagues, leech therapy was often employed as a desperate measure to treat the symptoms associated with these diseases, such as fever, inflammation, and the formation of buboes, swollen lymph nodes. Leeches were applied to the affected areas or near the buboes in their belief that their bloodletting action would help alleviate the buildup of harmful humors that caused the body to swell. From a modern medical perspective, we know that leech therapy was no cure, as the disease was caused by the bite of an infected flea into the entire blood of the victim. Unless they could drain every drop of blood and remove the bacteria in it, the leeches did next to nothing, if not just made the symptoms worse, as he was losing the very thing he needed to fight off infections. Herbal Remedies the most popular is something called Four Thieves Vinegar, a historical remedy with roots dating back to the Black Death in Europe which occurred during the 14th century. According to legend, four thieves could rob the deceased's homes without falling ill. When they were eventually caught and asked how they managed not to get the plague, they revealed that they had protected themselves from it by creating a unique vinegar infused with various herbs and spices. The recipe for Thieves Vinegar varies depending on different accounts and traditions. Still, common ingredients include vinegar as the base, along with herbs such as rue, sage, mint, mugwort, lavender, and garlic. The cure did work to some extent, as the herb mugwort would keep the rat carrying these fleas away, but this didn't protect people from the plague spread from person to person via contact. Flagellation because medieval Europe was very religious at the time, the idea of flagellation, the act of whipping or lashing oneself, often publicly, was seen by some as a form of penance, atonement, or a means of appeasing God's wrath believed to be the cause of plagues and epidemics. Groups of flagellants, known as the Flagellant Brotherhood, would travel from town to town whipping themselves with knotted ropes or other instruments in ceremonial processions. These public displays of self-punishment were believed to atone for sins and deflect God's punishment in the form of the plague. The practice came from believing that plagues and diseases were divine punishments for human transgressions. Through extreme penance and suffering, one could appease God's wrath and restore health and well-being to the afflicted communities. The Brotherhood even encouraged those suffering from the plague to come up on their stages and take part in the asking for forgiveness. There isn't an exact number given by the Brotherhood that would give someone the cure, Perhaps it was until you just got tired or couldn't hit yourself anymore. The logic behind it was skewed. If you didn't get better, you weren't repentant enough, so you would have to increase the number of lashes. And if you died, well, at least you were forgiven then. Exorcisms it might seem wild to you right now, but let's put ourselves in the shoes of a serf who had never even seen something like this before. Your wife in bed with massive pus-filled boils all over her body the size of eggs, giving off a horrible smell, as well as her being in delirium as a result of pain, she would say things that don't make sense. If a priest who was above you in terms of your position in society told you this was a demonic possession, you'd believe him. Exorcisms, rituals aimed at expelling evil spirits or demonic forces believed to be possessing or afflicting individuals, were seen as a potential cure or protection against these devastating diseases. The belief was that plagues and epidemics were punishments or the work of evil supernatural entities, and exorcisms were performed to cast out these forces and restore health and spiritual balance. Exorcism rituals varied across different cultures and religions, but often involved prayers, chants, holy objects or symbols, 
and occasionally physical acts such as sprinkling holy water or applying relics. In some cases, professional exorcists or clergy members would perform these rituals, while in other instances, individuals or families would conduct their exorcisms based on folk beliefs and traditions. As you can imagine, these exorcisms almost always failed as the holy water and chanting did nothing for the victims. And if they didn't recover, it was thought that the demonic possession was just too strong. Getting rid of the Jews. Easily among the most extreme forms of a failed cure, as the bubonic plague went through Europe in the 14th century, fear and superstition about the disease's true causes led to the spread of dangerous myths and conspiracy theories. In many areas, Jews became targets of these accusations and were blamed for supposedly causing or spreading the plague. The scapegoating was often fueled by pre-existing anti-Semitic ideas, religious intolerance, and the need to find someone or something to blame for the losses caused by the plague. The Jews were a relatively clean community, and they often stuck to themselves and washed hands when they could. So when the general population saw that the Jews weren't getting as sick, rumors and false claims circulated that Jews were poisoning wells or engaging in other evil acts to spread the disease. These accusations led to horrible consequences, as Jewish communities across Europe faced violence, expulsions, property seizures, and even massacres. Entire Jewish populations were murdered or driven out of towns and cities in a misguided attempt to stop the plague spread. And it wasn't until the plague began to slow down did the murders slow down as well. Carrying a Chicken the idea here was that carrying a live chicken could help absorb or divert the illness from an individual. It was thought that the chicken, a living creature, would act as a sponge or vessel, attracting and absorbing the poisonous vapors or miasmas believed to be the cause of the plague. Some even held the chicken close to their bodies or carried it under their clothing, hoping the bird would take the brunt of the illness. Another method involved plucking out all the feathers on a chicken's behind and placing them on the wound caused by the plague. The reasoning was that chickens breathe through their behinds and can exhale the harmful toxins in these wounds. If the chicken got the illness, it was a sign the cure was working. Today, we know that putting bacteria on an open wound can lead to more diseases. Yet this was the most popular method until the end of the plague. Amulets and Talismans during times of widespread epidemics, such as the Black Death that swept across Europe and Asia in the 14th century, people desperately sought any means of protection, even if it meant wearing amulets and talismans which came in many forms. Some common examples of amulets and talismans used during plague outbreaks included carved gemstones with astrological signs or mystical symbols, worn as pendants or rings or small pouches or bags containing herbs, roots, or other natural materials thought to ward off illness were also popular, essentially the medieval equivalent of zodiac signs and horoscopes. As we were assuming they didn't have any newspapers to read what the horoscope said, they would visit magic healers to tell them what signs and symbols to use. And because they were so scared, it made them so susceptible, with some of the conversations going along the lines of, if you walk around with this upside down circle it should protect you as it signifies prosperity in Chinese culture. My source? Why it came to me in a dream, of course. Thank <laughs> you.